So with that thought, thank you. Oh, great.
ground, there's a guy. And this happened until it got to a point where I would sit next to the disk drive, and I would hear a noise, and I would bet money that that guy's back there. So I was able to predict something just from recognizing a pattern. So that got me really fascinating about patterns. It's like, wow, that's pretty cool. I was able to predict the future by pattern recognition. So a lot of you guys know that I'm a, I'm a musician, um, you know, semi-pro musician. You know, professional means you get paid. Doesn't mean you're good. I often get paid to stop playing. <laughs> so in music, how many how many musicians do we have here? Only one? Few? Okay. Well, in guitar playing, since I've been a guitarist most of my life, there are patterns. Most of the music is a collection of patterns. If you're a blues guitarist, like there's BB King and there's um, jazz guitarists on the right. If you're like somebody like BB King, you know, or rest his soul. I mean, the other blues guitarists. And I said we're going to play a blues song in G, and it's a one four five. I would know how to play that. If you were a blues guitarist, you would know how to play that instantly. It's a pattern. And in jazz, there's something called a 251. Those are the numbers of the chords, the second chord, the five chord, and the one chord. Jazz guitars know from that pattern. They know how to play, how to collaborate. They know the chords that you're going to go to. They know the future. So I got fascinated with that. So in grad school, my, my project was to analyze melodies. And I kind of looked at probabilistic you know, trees, you know, this you know, had a probability of 80% it would go up or 20% it would go down. And I had this long you know, probability trees. And I was able to create an original melody, but in the style of a composer. So I would analyze all kinds of melodies and I would do all kinds of classical music. I did rock music. And I, and I actually was able to draw out just for eye candy, I kind of, kind of drew out the, the tablature and the, the tabs and kind of pressed my advisor. So, But the whole thing is that there were patterns. The patterns of the music predicted the next pattern, the next note, right? A collection of notes predicted another one. A pattern of notes predicted the future. I was really fascinated by this. Okay, then you know I, I had to get a job, and, and I worked for an investment bank. And as Renee pointed out, I one of the one of the companies I worked for was Lehman Brothers. Of course, you, you may remember that. <laughs> and we worked in, in fixed income research, and we had to look at portfolios. And these portfolios are not portfolios like you and I would have, like a few few equities and a few you know bond funds, just little ones. These are like have thousands. Securities, and we had to look at patterns and see, okay, well, can we figure out what, you know, what security affected another one? What, what, what variable affected another one? What, what variables were correlated? And we all know that there's people looking at patterns of trading to figure out the future, right? That's a very common thing in analytical trading. So there was financial patterns. So of course we tried to search for a correlation engine, and we tried to sell customers that. We had portfolio attribution that we can tell you why your portfolio went up and went down, which is BS actually. It was just looking at the weighted, you know, you had this much money there, that much money there, so that was that was that that contribution to your portfolio. But that's not why your portfolio went up. That's just the weights of your holdings, right? And then we also tried to figure, well, we were smart people, so let's figure out what's the cause, not just correlation, but causation. Right? The causation is fairly important. Why did it really, really go up or go down? That's really hard. It was so hard we just gave up. <laughs> and of course, Lehman Brothers gave up. <laughs> or the government gave up on Lehman Brothers. And we can tell you stories too. <laughs> that you don't read the press. So it was all about patterns. So patterns is key. And we all know as being developers, right, the famous book. Right? The, the goth book, Gang of Four, right? And we all know patterns. Because we, we, they noticed, not maybe then, before them, there was actually who invented, I forget who, who came before this. It might have been, maybe it was Grady, Grady Booch, 
But anyway, so it was like looking at code and detecting like, okay, that chunk comes up over and over again. That's some sort of, that's the decorator pattern. That's the facade pattern. That's this pattern and that's the pattern. So it's a collection of patterns. There's pat the word pattern came up again. So this is 1995. So where did that book come from? Where did, where did design patterns and code come from? It came from architecture, building architecture. So in 1977, a pattern language, was, which is about patterns for construction. I mean, what I mean construction, building construction, not, not code construction. 1977. So this, this book led to the first wiki, and of course, wiki, Wikipedia. Right. So this influenced the invention of Wikipedia. And it also influenced agile development. Because it's patterns. So this is really key. I want to hammer home that it's, it's all about patterns. So now let's kind of step to the side. Let, let's look at traditional computing that we've all been doing for the past several decades. Right? Traditional Java, C++ computing. So most of the things we do the algorithms are well defined, right? We can you know, calculate averages of some sports score. We can find the highest one. We can figure out how much money is in the, in the subway from you know, the last turnstile. We can count the number of people, the number of repos. Very, very direct deterministic algorithms, right? And, and when we come up with these algorithms, like here's traditional software. Think about how we write software. Okay, so here's somebody gives you a problem. And then you basically either use pseudocode, you use a flow chart, you just think out loud, you scribble it down. You come up with an algorithm as if you're going to solve the problem. Right? Think about it. You're coming up with a solution as if you're going to solve it, except that the machine's going to do it faster, more distributed, more scalable, you know, better, better, better. Right? But you actually figure it out as if you're going to do it. So we come up with these programs that have if statements in them, right? Like they're like expert systems. All of our programs have you know if thens and branches here and there. So it's a collection of, of, of if statements. Sort of like an expert system. Not quite like you know in the expert systems in the nineteen late eighties and early nineties, but very, very similar in, in philosophy. But a lot of algorithms are not well defined. A lot of algorithms are not well defined. So, for example, let's look at visual recognition since it's easy to, to see. So here we have a picture of a chihuahua on the left and a uh, muffin on the right. Now, now, we all know what a chihuahua is and a muffin, and a, and a, and a muffin, right? So I gave this presentation in Nigeria and nobody knew what a chihuahua was or a muffin. <laughs> it was like, nobody knows what a chihuahua is. It's like, oh, yes. Like, so that's a puppy on the left, and that's a cupcake. <laughs> so if I asked you, like, write a program that determines whether a picture is either a chihuahua or a muffin, what would you do? OK, well, there's, there's two large dark spots. OK, so if there's two large dark spots and one in the middle, that's one rule. If you these little tiny little things like whiskers, that's another rule. If it's brown up there at the top, um, that's another rule. If it's white here. So I come up with a bunch of rules. Okay, maybe I have you know a dozen rules. And I think I'm I'm fine. But then someone says, okay, great, you got that working? Let's put it in production. <laughs> now I have many, many pictures, and here I have a couple dozen, but maybe I have hundreds, thousands, millions of pictures that I have to determine whether something's a chihuahua or something is a, a, a muffin. <laughs> so it goes, okay, and then your program fails, and it fails because, okay, well, I didn't figure out there was two chihuahuas in the picture. I don't know, maybe the, the dog was, I don't know, that's a, what is that? <laughs> so you have to come up with additional rules. Maybe the face was rotated. Right? Maybe it was inverse. Maybe it was more than one. Maybe it's not brown. Maybe it's a different colored chihuahua. So over time, you're adding more and more and more and more rules. So instead of dozens of rules, you start to have hundreds of rules. And in some use cases, thousands of rules. And in some other use cases, millions of rules. So what happens when you have millions of rules? How do you debug that? 
right? So the complexity is going up. And all you as, as developers know, when the complexity goes up, what happens? Bugs go up. Bugs go up. The chance for bugs go up, right? So you want to keep the complexity down. You don't, if, you, if you feel something is complicated, it probably is, and you probably should think of another solution. So having like thousands of millions of rules, it's probably not, not, not the right algorithm. So using an expert system to do visual recognition is just not the right thing. But where else does this apply? I mean, obviously there are other use cases besides chihuahuas and muffins, right? So any application has huge numbers of parameters and lots and lots of data. So what type of applications are those? The hard problems, right? The really hard problems that we have. The weather, right? With weather, there's, there's many, many millions of parameters to evaluate. I think I was looking at that one, um, one machine learning application for weather, and there was like 140 million input parameters. Of course, in trading, there's lots of, there's lots of var variables, right? It could be not just the, like for, for an equity, for a, for a stock, not just the health of a company, but it's the environment of a company, who's the CEO, who's on the board, so all these other variables, right? Um, in security, um, in, in healthcare, which is a huge, huge business, and, um, and it's a growing business. If you notice, all the cloud companies are now hiring healthcare experts. That's the next big thing for cloud companies. Right, so, the, the, of course, anti-spam, um, if you use Gmail, right, there's machine learning on the back end already. Right? That's, a, that's why you don't get that much spam with Gmail. You ever wonder why? Because there's machine learning looking for, for, uh, for patterns. In the old days, we used to have whitelists and blacklists. Remember those? Right? What happened to those? You start getting more and more. The list, your list was wrong, right? That means something was wrong. It was getting too complicated, so that wasn't the right solution for, for detecting spam. So, so Gmail is, is one. So certainly all the, all the mail vendors have that. But these are all these applications that require, you know, um, that have patterns and lots of data. Language translation. I mean, if you go to Google Translate, that uses all machine learning now. It's it's um, it's so much better than it used to be. One of these days, you know, Apple could, could, their uh, their ML will get better, but uh, Microsoft is really good with with the language translation. Social media monitoring to detect semantic analysis. If you want to like look at tweets and then see whether your product is, you know, people are happy with your product or not, look at patterns. So all these applications, tons of applications. So this is the core of machine learning. It's looking for patterns. Right? We talked about patterns. It's making, it's recognizing patterns and then making predictions based on the patterns. You're predicting the future based upon patterns. Right? This goes so it's quite simple. And we used to think historically that we thought of well, algorithms were the thing. I mean, we're always focused on algorithms, and then there's the data, you put the data through the algorithms. But with machine learning, this. The algorithms are typically very straightforward, very scalable, right? They're very parallelizable, but the focus is on data, huge amounts of data. So the difference between traditional computing and machine learning is very similar to how you learn foreign language. So you could go to school for four years and learn the rules about learning, you know, whatever you want to learn. learn. Italian or French, you, you go and you learn, study the rules, and then you, then you go out and you try to speak it. Or, you can do it conversationally, right? You go to the country and you sit down with an expert, and you talk, and they correct you. And then you talk almost like immediately, you're in conversation, right? Remember that, that style of, of learning language? So think of this as like, on the left you have traditional computing, and on the right you have machine learning. That's a, that's a really good analogy for what we have for rules versus um, patterns. Now, and it's not just for languages, but the philosophers thought about this too. And it's, it just wasn't just yesterday, right? So here we have somebody, um, we have Rene Descartes, like a little hard rock guy here, uh, from the 17th century, 
he thought that everything had structure. There were rules for the universe. And once you knew the rules, you can really understand the universe. And then a hundred years later, in the 18th century, here we have David Hume. And he looks quite tragically hip in his outfit there. <laughs> um, he thought that, no, you look at nature. And you look at the patterns. And nature will tell you how it works. So it's like two different philosophies. One was about rules, and one was about obs observing patterns. And this is, wasn't yesterday. This was done many, many years ago. So this all comes back to statistics. So machine learning is really statistics and data science. I mean, all data science is statistics. How many people took a stat class in school? And you thought, probably, I'm probably never going to use that again, right? <laughs> but you're wrong. <laughs> so, so now, you could, now you're going to use it. And if you want to be a data scientist, not just an application program, if you want to be a data scientist, you have to understand the statistics. It's really important. And here's, here's a little, little cartoon about we have statistics, and then just like in computer science, we typically <laughs> rename things every few years and think it's something new. <laughs> so, so here's <laughs> you just put a new name on it's called machine learning, and if you're presenting to VCs, it's called artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> So it's really software 2.0. It's a different way of doing software. You don't come up with the algorithm. You observe patterns in the data. And the data tells you the future. So just a little step back in the history of AI. So in 56, there was a, a conference at Dartmouth. Um, this is the very first conference on AI. There's a founding fathers of AI. I wonder how you grow a beard like that. <laughs> you always have to have a guy who looks like a crazy scientist. But those are the founding fathers of AI. This is 1956, right? Neural networks, which I'll talk about in, the, in a few minutes, but neural networks, the first synthetic neural network, the first artificial one, was 1943. So this is before punch cards. First artificial neural network. Anybody know when the first supper team was invented? Anyone guess? 1946. So, that, so, so this is before supper teams were invented. And then, of course, we have Norbert Wiener um, in 1948. He came up with a book called Cybernetics. You may have heard of the book uh, of the term cybernetics. Um, it's certainly still popular in Europe. Um, it's not as popular here. I'm not sure why, but he was doing AI before AI. This is 1948, right, his book. And he said, one of the most interesting aspects of the world is that it can be considered to be made up of patterns. And that's what we're doing now with machine learning. And this is like 1948. Unfortunately, he was a little eccentric, so people didn't listen to him. <laughs> But, but um, and, and of course, we didn't have the hardware back then to, to, that we do now. I mean, why is machine learning all of a sudden becoming popular? Well, we all knew it was kind of cool, right? This is really interesting. But now we have cloud computing. We can have thousands of machines in a, in a split second, right? We can start, we can start with a thousand machines and thousand, thousand VMs easily. We have huge collections of data. And then our neural networks, we have different algorithms for neural networks. And neural networks are very easy to implement. So you may have heard the term AI, of course. I mean, see the sci-fi movie, right? So what is AI versus machine learning? So AI is just what it says, artificial intelligence. It's simulating human intelligence. Anything that does that is AI. That's the general term. Anything that emulates human intelligence is artificial Machine learning is a, is a class, well, actually, world job developers, it's a subclass of AI. Right? It's a subclass of AI where the machine learns, okay? where, where the machine is learning more about um, the data. The more data you feed it, the more it learns. So it's a subclass of AI. 
deep learning is a subclass of machine learning. Machine learning is a subclass of, uh, deep learning is a subclass of machine learning where it's using more computational resources and you're using neural networks. Most of the research done now is deep learning. We still call it machine learning. You may read it in the press that says machine learning and you see television program machine learning. We're really talking about, I mean, we're, we're, the, we're in the field, right? It's really deep learning. That's the real, that's the real formalism, but okay, machine learning. You we see it in the magazine. It's, but it's really uh, deep learning. Where we're using powerful cloud, you know, cloud um, instances to help us. Now, what are the business drivers? I mean, I, I know there's some people here, not just developers, but I know there's a couple of managers here, so I'll quickly go over this. Um, is to make decisions, right? To make decisions. <laughs> so I, I put this up. Um, let's say uh, you're doing monitoring. Um, you're responsible for monitoring, which which I was for a while. So descriptive, what happened? So you're monitoring say memory usage, so you track memory usage of your VMs and your machines, um, the number of instances of your app servers, um, with how long the, the, the JVM was up. You're, you're monitoring things, right? Diagnostic, okay, what relationships are involved? Let, let's say like your machines crashed, um, memory went up, and, you're, and you were starting up app servers. Okay, well, those are th three things I think they're related. Then you try to make inferences, well, were they related somehow? So you try to take this whole data set and say, like, well, maybe because I started the app servers, it caused memory to go up, and it, I didn't have enough memory, and the machines crashed, right? And then you predict, okay, well, if I see that scenario coming up, and I'm starting up too many app servers, and I see the memory going up, I know the machines are going to crash. So you can predict. So it used to be that that was it. You can, you can predict what happened, but now we, what should you do? So the reason why managers and companies are interested in machine learning is that, what do I do? Okay, if you can predict the future, what should I do? That's why companies and businesses are interested in machine learning. So that's why I have prescriptive, and that's why the subtitle of the talk is Patterns, Predictions, and Prescriptions. So for businesses, it's what do I do? There's prescriptive part. Right? You recognize patterns, you anticipate the likely future of, of similar data, and then you take steps to, to make more money, to save money, or whatever, to maximize business. Right? That, that's the reason. Okay, so, so here's the process. So, first of all, you look at a problem. And you say, like, well, if I give it all this input, can I predict the output? So in machine learning, you already know the output. You already know the output. So if like you're uh, at a bank and you give out mortgages to people, then you know that a person comes in and you look at their salary, where's the house located, a bunch of different variables. And if you know from those variables, you can predict yes or no, right? So you know ahead of time. So you look at a problem. If you can predict the output, potentially if this is a machine learning solution. Right? Not, not all problems require machine learning use, uh, solution. So then you, you, you hire a data scientist. Right? This is why you, you, either you become one or you hire a data scientist. You select a machine learning algorithm for that problem. So there, there's certain algorithms for certain problems. And then you train the algorithm with test data. And it has to be clean test data. And, uh, and Vinay alluded to what Fabian said last, last or two months ago about clean data. Calculate the error. So if you feed us all this data and you said, like, well, sure enough that if I gave it, the person wasn't making enough money, do I give it a mortgage? And if the answer was yes, something's wrong with my model. So I have to tweak my model so that I, given the same data, the answer should be no or yes, whatever it is. But you have, there's all these parameters with each model, and you tweak it, so finally you pump the data, and you get the answer you expect. So you train data, tweak, and output. And so finally, your error is minimized. You do this over and over and over again. So finally you get to a point like, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay with error being that, that small. And then once you have the error, 
get new data, production data, and then your, your business. That's the basic steps for machine learning. Right? You data prep, you train a model, and you do this over and over again, and then you do the test model over and over again, and then you put it in production. But again, as Fabian said two months ago, this is not drawn to scale. That's drawn to scale. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the work you do is on a data prep side. Most of the work you do is on the data prep side. And some of it is, is, is drudgery, to be quite honest. Right? It's making sure you have clean data. Clean, unbiased data. You know, the, 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 uh, the values are within certain tolerances. This is the hard part. Everybody wants to rush to the algorithm and play around the neural network and have the fun stuff, but you have to make sure the data is, is right. So there's there's three basic types of machine learning: supervised, which you know for for the past few years I mean, we've been using supervised learning, where like for example if you're detecting pictures of cats, somebody has given it given the machine pictures of cats, but then put metadata metadata in the picture. This is a cat, so it's previously labeled. Some human put, this is a cat. This is not a cat. <laughs> this, is, this is a cat, this is not a cat. So that's, that's supervised. But since it requires humans, it's not scalable, right? So there's unsupervised. So unsupervised is where the machine looks at the data and figures out like, hmm, okay, I think I can figure out a pattern here. So the machine's gonna figure out by, by itself whether something is a cat or not a cat, just by looking at the data. So that's the theory, I think, in, in practice. Or recently, we found out that something that is sort of like semi-unsupervised works best, where a human kick-starts it, and then the rest of the machine is it. So it's sort of like semi-unsupervised. That seems to be um, a good, design, a good um, solution. And then next is reinforcement learning, trial and error. For example, this is how machines learn to beat people at video games over, over and over and over again. So that, those are the three types. So the types of learning, they're supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised, and reinforcement. Now, when you take a course on, on machine learning, and I'll point out some good courses to take for you guys to take, it'll go way more detailed than I just did in the two minutes, but that's the basic idea. And with the machine algorithms, there are many, many machine learning algorithms. Don't assume that there's one machine learning algorithm. There's several. And you obviously can't read that slide, but these are a list of, of many different algorithms. And which one do you pick? This is why you hire a data scientist. For a certain use case, a certain machine learning algorithm would be good for that use case. Data scientists know that. Back at Lehman, we used to work with economists who were the data scientists of the day, right? And actually, they wrote, they wrote stuff in S plus and R, but we never deployed in S plus R. We always deployed in C, C plus plus back then. So, sort of analogous to Python and deploying in another language, but history often repeats itself. Now, neural networks, they're commonly associated with deep learning. There's a simple simple uh, neural network. On the left, in, in orange, all the way to the left, input layer. Each one of those nodes on the left is a parameter. So like for a mortgage, it should be like someone's salary, the house location. Each one is a parameter. Now, obviously, it's, this is a trivial example, three parameters. There's typically many, many parameters. And what happens is that the, the values and weights of each of the nodes, like each one of these circles is a computation node. The great thing about neural nets is they're what's called embarrassingly parallelizable. They're very scalable. So you can, you can put this into the cloud and you just start up like you know, many, many machines and, and uh, have your neural network work on and many machines. It's, it's a very simple data structure. It's a directed graph. This, this one's called a feed-forward neural network. Here's one with, with multiple layers. 
So it, I mean, it looks complicated, but normally from from um, from our point of view, you have input parameters, and the input parameters um, they have a weight. There's an input value, like like a, someone's salary or the location of the house. Then there's a weight. How important is that as a as a variable? And then each input node like sums up each one of the uh, input parameters uh, with a function. And another function spits it out, you know, massages it and spits it out. So each one of these nodes is doing that. So there are many different types of neural networks, but they basically do that same thing. They, they take in, there's inputs, weights, they get accumulated, and then they get spit out. And this function is input function and output function. And here I have a two layer um, neural network three layers, four layers, five layers. The more layers, the more accuracy. The more layers, the more computation you need. So it's not just a free freebie. More accuracy, more layers. And again, this is embarrassingly paralyzing. So that's, that's the cool thing about neural, neural networks. And this is just for visual recognition. So it, here's, here's this one, has, there's like four or five layers to this. The more layers, the more, the more accuracy. And there's not just one type of neural network. There's many types of neural networks. And again, a data scientist would know which neural network to use for a certain use case. Whether it's visual recognition, whether it's for risk management, whether it's for the weather, whether it's for trucking, uh, trucking company, different, different neural networks. So we all know that everybody's doing AI. So here's, here's a list of companies. I mean, there's, there's zillions of companies doing AI now. Right? Here's companies. This is just an Israel startup. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so how do you how do you adopt it? And, and I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but for, for I noticed that there's like four or five managers in the group. Is try a pilot project. Try a project that is meaningful. Right, not a trivial thing, but something meaningful, but it's not going to risk the family jewels. Right, it's not, not going to bring down your company if you screw up. <laughs> so, but it's something that's meaningful. Right, and then you build an in-house team, um, and then you train people. Right, and, and this is not just for machine learning. This is like it, as any consultant would tell you, this is how you adopt new technology. Right, you, you educate the, the managers um, and the engineers, and of course this is. Um, and then you communicate pro progress. I mean, if you take out the word AI ML and replace it with something else, the, the technology it holds, it holds true. Right? Any, any good consultant will tell you that. Okay. And a good thing to, to, to learn about an ML, read about an ML system. There's, there's tons of stories out there on a working ML system. Somebody was like looking at log files and determining whether, you know, the way memory was being used was a, was a pattern for something that happened. And read it, duplicate it. Duplicate that using your data. When you do that, and maybe you have some colleagues working with you, you'll start to get ideas of what you can use for yourself. But once, if you duplicate it using someone's stories, like just follow along and, and then use it for your data, you'll, you'll instantly get, up, get ideas of how to use it. So we know all the use cases for, for, for ML. Uh, log files is a big one. Uh, but I wanted to point out some other, other places where AI and ML is used now. Because I, I know that there's a lot of big companies that are still on, on the fence about using machine learning. They're, they're saying, well, we're, we're not sure. We, we have data analytics is probably good enough. Like, you know, I'm not sure. But let's look at some use cases outside of the norm especially for New York, right? So here's a, here's a company, Blue River. So we know that um, you know, when you have crops, you, you often have to use pesticide, hopefully organic pesticide. Um, and most times you spray organic pesticides over all your crops, maybe unnecessarily. So what this company has come up with was a mechanism um, to look at the plant before it sprays it this is needed, right? And, and it looks at it and says, like, I, I know about diseases of this particular plant, and if I see that, I'm going to spray the plant. If not, I'm not going to spray the plant. 
So this company has saved millions of dollars for farm for farmers. This is agriculture. So pig farmers are using ML for facial recognition to see whether animals are are sick or not. This has caused you know them to save you know, millions of dollars. Salmon fishermen. So so there's a company that has a facial recognition system that looks at the <coughs> lice diseased on the fish. And when fish swim by it, it, it says that fish is diseased, it forces them to go one direction where undiseased fish go the other direction. So then they treat the, the fish that only have the diseases. So it's optimal, it, it's optimal for the fish farm. And here's like cows. Here's a sick cow that hasn't been eating for a while. So ML is being used in farming. So if you're an investment bank and you haven't used ML, and you have like these people in agriculture using you know advanced ML techniques already, working and saving money, like, that seems a bit like a no brainer. Okay. So how to get started? World Java developers. <laughs> so um, so uh, so I noticed this a couple years ago, like. Uh, I want to do machine learning, but everyone says, okay, you have to learn Python. And, it, and there's nothing more than Python. Python's a good language, right? It's an easy language. There's a lot of numerical uh, packages for it. It's, it's, it's really good. But I'm a Java developer. How could I, how could I do machine learning? Actually, I, I gave this presentation, and it wasn't a hey. <laughs> I, I had to change it to a hey. I had uh, <laughs> <and> something else. <laughs> so please change that. Okay. Um, so I I, um, I arranged a conference um, in Rome uh, on machine learning, and one of my speakers, this guy Humphrey Shell from the UK, he was a Java developer, um, and he was going for his PhD. He wrote this thing about like. I had to learn Python. I was forced to learn Python. And I've been a Java programmer for 20 years. And I wanted to do ML, but I couldn't. So we had a chat, and we had we had dinner at this nice place, this little uh, Trattoria Al Ron Sasso in Rome, um, across the conference. And we discussed, like, what does Java need for ML? So I didn't know, but he was mentally taking notes. So he wrote this um, in Medium, so you can look up with job needs for machine learning, uh, machine deep learning support in a, a medium. And he, it's a long article, and he, we, he details everything we talked about at dinner, of what Java needs. And we, we basically, I took this to, uh, to Oracle, I took it to Microsoft, I took it to Alibaba, I took it to Twitter, uh, or other JVM companies. I took it to IBM, I took it to, and we said like, you guys have a JVM. There's 12 million Java developers out there. How do we make sure that Java is a first class citizen? So we started an initiative since we had dinner there. We called it the Grand Sasso Initiative for Java for Machine Learning. And we are in the process of talking to all these different companies. And all the companies are excited uh, and working together. Because it seemed like somebody was doing something over here, somebody's doing something over there. And nothing was coordinated. Like Oracle is building a numerical package, but okay, it would be nice if I knew that I could build something on top of it, or vice versa. Uh, TensorFlow, TensorFlow's Java API is suboptimal. The Java API from Google and for TensorFlow is not the best. So there's a group out there that's focused on building a really good Java API. We didn't know about that. So we want to get all these people, and we contacted them all. They all want to like submit something for Grand Sasso. This is more like an informational, so everybody knows where to get the best Java stuff for, for ML. So look for the websites coming soon. With, I mean, we, we actually have the, the domain and everything, but we're talking to people to submit information on, on uh, machine learning for Java. So there's a lot of Java toolkits. Um, we looked at a lot of them, and both my colleagues and I um, a lot of them require a data scientist head, but you have to understand data analytics and statistics really, really well. Or some of the libraries are wrappers around C++ libraries, and they have a C++ flavor. It looks like Java, but they're really C++. 
So it's, it wasn't really you know, that nice. So there's a couple of new languages, like, like DL4J is very popular. Sort of has, it's very complicated. I mean, I wouldn't expect you to pick it up and say like, yeah, now I know machine learning. It's very complicated. So um, we've, been, we've been talking to some of these vendors in Amazon actually, we just had a call uh, with them the other day. But they're about to release a new library called D DJL. Of course, I'm confusing with DLJ up there. <laughs> DJL, um, another library for Java. And um, my colleague, um, Laura out in Serbia, we're working on visual recognition API, JSR381, to do visual recognition for Java. So a standard API, that's a Java-flavored API, right? If you're an Android programmer, um, two versions ago, I think, eight, version 8 with Android, you have a neural network API right in the distribution of Android. So you can start right away, start coding up an ML app. So, so this JSR that I'm, that I'm working on with my colleague, and, and actually we just released the beta just yesterday. So, um, so I had the, uh, yeah, there's, there's the, uh, the URL down, down below. So it's, it's a Java friendly API to do visual recognition. So given some images, you can train it um, to recognize cats, dogs, or you know, um, damaged tires, like some, you know, because trucking companies have to change their tires, right? When they change their tires, you can't rely on the driver to do that. You'd rather rely on the machine to tell you, right? So it's a Java friendly API. So it uses standard Java stuff. As a Java developer, you will know how to use it. And it's way more readable than, than looking at some old C code. Now we're not going to show some demos here, but there's a lot of um, a lot of cool demos here. Here's just the Google one. Microsoft has a lot of cool demos, and so does Amazon. But this, this is one I want to talk about a little bit about futures. And this is like really cool. So so it's, I've so far I just talked about data and analysis, right? Patterns. Okay, that's interesting. But yeah, but so what? Okay, yeah, it's, we've sort of done something like this before. This paper, so paper <coughs> learned index structures, to me, this is going to be one of those seminal papers in computer in computing. So you should get a copy of this paper and at least read you know, the abstract or read the summary at the bottom. What they're saying is that since, and of course there's Jeff Dean uh, from Google, Jeff Dean's like the number one AI guy from Google. They said by applying machine learning to data access, like databases, data structures, things like that, they've improved performance by 70%. Just initial tests by 70%, and they've reduced memory consumption by orders of magnitude. So by applying ML to data access, they just raise the bar. So they're, they're, saying, they're, they're saying, they're positing that Perhaps we can replace the data structures that databases uses, that operating systems use, with machine learning. So it learns as it goes. You know, this is like a very, very sophisticated catch, extremely sophisticated catch. And memory usage is reduced by an order of magnitude. This is a this is huge. So now in the future, we may have operating systems that have ML at the core, that learn as, as, you, as, you, uh, as you go. So for a while there, I mean, computing was getting a little bit kind of boring. I mean, like, how, much, how much can you read about app servers? <laughs> excited. <laughs> but, but now, I mean, for, for, for young um, developers and, and young engineers in computing, this is a phenomenal time first of all, come out of school, and also for all of us in computing, the next few years, it's going to be like computer architecture is completely going to change because of ML. Architecture is going to change. It's not the, the same old operating system, same old languages. Things are going to change. And we have a lot of hardware out there. So in the, in the, uh, in the Bay Area, there are hundreds of AI hardware startups that 
instead of having like CPU and memory, some of them are putting CPU and memory on the same chip. Or we're having a, 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 a systems on chip, a, a so-called SOC, SOC, where everything is on chip, where there's multiple cores, but not within a CPU. This, this one has two cores, this one has six cores, this one has eight cores, and memory, it's like, a, like several machines on a chip to reduce data latency. Because that's what machine learning is about, it's about data access, right? With, with hundreds of companies doing that, and the new type of architecture, this is like a golden time to be a computer scientist. This is a golden time to be a computer scientist. And once we have the primitive stuff done, the hardware and the operating system and the old substrate stuff, what happens next? The languages. Right? What comes after Java? What comes, what's the new stuff? What's the next JVM? What's, you know, all these new languages. That happens after the hardware. So we have for, for the next 10 years, this is golden era of computing. So everything just got elevated. So as I said before in the first few slides, the more I read about this, this is an inflection point for computing. It's not just about looking for patterns of data to, to, for, for mortgages, although, although it's important. This has a dramatic impact for our industry. Right, and here's Dr. John Hennessy, who gave a um, keynote at the AI uh, Hardware Summit. And, and uh, Dr. Hennessy is one of the inventors of RISC, you know, reduced instruction set computing. He's one of the inventors of that. And he says that this is a, you know, a new era for, for all of us. And this type of hardware and software is, we're going to have applications like this. Instead of requiring most of the data center to do this type of work, it's going to be done by, by a small device. Right? This is done by traditional computing, CPU, memory, old-fashioned von Neumann style stuff. Now, what else are we using ML for? Well, OK. Um, there was this article saying that, um, so a program analyzed uh, several million abstracts and made a discovery. Because it looked for connections. Now that's pretty cool, right? It's, and we're saying like, well, machines can't be creative. But can they? Maybe they can. Here's, here's a machine that looked at abstract and it made connections with different data. Just by analyzing the data. OK, that's cool, because if, if it knew about, like, say, um, medicine, Right? And it's very domain specific. Machine learning is typically very domain specific. It knows about medicine, about you know, uh, bad tires, it knows about cats, it knows about chihuahuas. But once we figure out how to do cross domain, that's we're in the realm of creativity. Right? Once we can do cross domain analysis of data, this is what Steve Jobs says. What's creativity? It's basically just looking at things and making connections. That's what creativity is. That's what machine learning is going to do. When we can do cross-domain analysis of data, we're going to see discovery at, at levels we've never, ever seen before. Because machines are going to make the connections in different domains. And this is like within our lifetimes. So we're really close to doing cross-domain stuff. I mean, this is like fascinating. To do cross-domain discovery. Why this happens all the time, like somebody in medicine said like, well, this does this, and I was reading something about you know, music, well, this happens, and I sort of made the connection, and then we came over an invention. Machines are going to do that. And here's a, you know, Professor Hank from Stanford, Stanford uh, this is, he started Coursera, he started deep learning AI, so he's very well known in the field. He has some great courses. Um, if you Google Andrew Hang intro to machine learning, uh, the first, the first one is really good. The second one, your, your head will explode <laughs> with, with the, the with statistics. I mean, it's useful if you want to be a data scientist, uh, but at least listen to the first hour one. It's, it's really, really good. He says that AI is in electricity, and then when the electricity came out, countries that had electricity were considered the advanced societies. Countries that did not have electricity behind. So he's making an analogy that organizations that have AI ML are going to be above the other ones. And I really agree with that. But like any new new technology, there's the Faustian bargain we have to make, right? Every new technology has a downside. 
cell phones. <laughs> Texting. They all, they all have downsides, right? They're really good for certain things, but there's a little downside. So, then, and there's a lot of downsides, and there's a lot of issues to, to worry about. So you need to have clean data. And, they, and again, as, as uh, Fabian said two months ago, a lot of our data is not clean data. And it's not just value. It's like if you know, one of the parameters has to be between zero and one, and you have value of two, you have to fix that. It's, it's more than that. Some of the data may be biased. Maybe bias, you know, maybe gender. Maybe it's a you know, bias towards men against women, or a racial bias. So you have to be really careful about, about about clean data. And again, much of an ML application is in the data engineering aspect. Somebody on your team, you know, if you have a team, if you're not building a an, an ML app, you have uh, data engineers, right? And you have data scientists, and then you have application developers. So. Clean data, privacy and ethics. So as we go forward, every student of computer science will have to be will, will be forced, or should be forced, to understand ethics in computing. And a lot of schools are already doing this. Part of a degree in computer science, you have to understand ethics. And it's also scary because there are some countries that have different type, different uh, definitions of ethics. Um, so the hacking that will occur now is not hacking your application code, it's now hacking the data. It's poisoning your data, right? If, if, your, if your model is relying on the data to predict the future, to come up with a result, well, I'm a hacker, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attack the data, I'm going to poison the data. So there's going to be different types of, of attacks now. It's not just like, you know, or the Java State website gets attacked all the time. It's like, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not funny. I mean, since I have to, I have to monitor this stuff, um, it's just attacking WordPress, right? Because it's always attacked. Like, okay, somebody's trying to put an array. I can see it. Somebody's attempting to put an array and, and buffer overflow into WordPress. Like, come on, you have to block that, have to block that IP address. It's a, it's, a, it's a battle. But now it's poisoning the data. Because your program will run. It runs fine. It gives the results. But the data's bad. Okay. Interpretability. So neural networks are very easy to implement for people that understand those those uh, those algorithms. Very very straightforward. But if you have multiple layers in a neural network, how is it actually really working inside? Why did it come up with that result? So if you, if you're that our example of a mortgage. So a couple comes in, a young couple, and they want to have the house mortgage, and they're denied. Why were they denied? Well, the machine said so. <laughs> I think that's not a good answer. So the interpretability of machine learning algorithms is really important. And that's a whole separate field. That's a whole separate field. How do you analyze the results of, of, of deep learning and tell you why the machine made that? Because now we have neural networks. In the future, maybe there's another type of deep learning. Somebody recently said, like, instead of deep learning, we're going to use differential equations. And they had all the disadvantages of doing that. So it might not be neural networks in the future, but you have to be able to interpret the data. Why did that occur? And the last time we didn't know why things were occurring was, I think, in 2008. And we know what happened then. Right? So we have to know. Have to interpret the data. And there are, there are companies that have engines, interpretability engines. In the valley, there's some startups that have interpretability engines for ML, and they get plugged into like in TensorFlow and, and uh, Microsoft uh, ML engine. Um, of course, this is sort of good for us, right? Um, talent is scarce. In other words, if we learn about ML and we learn about data scientists, we're going to be very employable. Right? People that understand data science and, and ML very, very employable. And it's not just uh, in one field, it's across global fields. So this is good for us. I mean, this is one of the good things about computing, it's always changing, right? So it's always good for us. We, we, we're lucky, we're, we, we work in a lucky industry. We're, we're all talented too, right? Um, this is another one. Correlation is not causality. That's that's a really important one. We know var variables impact another variable, but 
what's the cause? Why did that variable go up? Or why did we get that result? I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second. And also deep fakes, um, which I'll, I'll show an example. And, and we know recently, um, I guess this is about a month ago, so somebody used one of the software tools out there and, and was able to take a manager's voice and change it so it told an employee to take out money. <laughs> that's, that's not funny, but it, it pulled up an employee and said in, in an urgent way, take the money out and do this with it. And it was a machine saying that. And the employee did since he thought it was his boss. So it used some of these mimicking tools to do that. So um, that was uh, that was a bad thing. <laughs> okay, then, then there's also fake images. So which person is real and which one is not real? Who says the one on the left is real? This one's real. Who says this one's real? The one on the left is real. The one on the right is an image of a person that does not exist. That person never existed on this planet. And yet some of you thought it was real. That's how good that these deep fakes are. And there's this website. And I bet if you go to that site and you try all these different faces, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't guess. It was like, it's random. They're really, really good. So here's a, you may have seen this. So these are images of faces. Or, Specifically, celebrities. None of these people exist. None of them. None of these people have ever existed on this planet before. Yet, if you saw some of these pictures, you say, "Oh yeah, yeah, this, that person exists." They're <laughs> pretty, pretty accurate. Just by feeding data, the machine was able to come up with original celebrity faces based on the data. <coughs> Yeah, it's, some are actually pretty good. Pretty scary. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, now this other thing is that, um, you know, back at, at um, Lehman, we were trying to find out correlation. We were trying to find a correlation engine. Know, what was what variables were correlated to another one? It was, it's a hard it's a hard problem, right? And you see a variable like okay, the rooster crows and the sun comes up, but obviously the rooster doesn't cause the sun to come up, right? But they're correlated, <coughs> right? They're correlated, but what's the, there's no causation, right? <laughs> Unless maybe there's some sci-fi movie or something like that. <laughs> but doesn't the sun cause the rooster to crow? <laughs> so causation is difficult, right? We don't know, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a very hard problem to definitively say, like, you know, I, I, I smoked when I was a kid and I, now I have lung cancer. Was that the reason why I have lung cancer? Well, they're correlated. Was that the cause? I don't know. There are scientists now working machine learning scientists working on causation. They're actually doing research to find why things are where they are. In other words, causation, using machine learning. You know how big of a, of a discovery that would be? This is the reason why that happened. It's because this, this, and this. And I know within the 90% you know, probability. Not just they're correlated. Because that one, those things cause that, and and so this is one one scientist that I mean, it's a major scientist, but there are several scientists that are now working on this problem. So this is what I was saying before, like you know, it's not just machine learning, but it's forking off these threads of, of interesting things. That's why it has deep roots. This is not something that's going to go away. The machine learning is going to go away in a couple of years. This has deep roots, 
And it's, it's not just for like uh, simple data analysis. Right, and, so for, and for downstream effects, okay. So as I said, machine learning would be pervasive. I mean, I was looking at, at a, a video from, from Huawei uh, in their recent conference, and they have a, a chip, I don't know if maybe their new chip, it's an AI chip. They already have it in an earpiece. It's so tiny, it's an earpiece, and they have ML, like an ML algorithm in your ear. So if you're looking at a trend, Computing at the edge has been, been a big trend for a long time. It used to be, computing at the, at the edge used to be CDNs, right? The regular content delivery networks, right? Who's the big player? Yeah. Right? Acquise has been the big player there. Well, it's not just caching things, but now we have ML at the edge, right? We have devices in our hands, you know, maybe inside of our bodies and in our cars that have ML. So over time, we're going to see a lot of very, very interesting things. There's so many companies working on ML at the edge at this point. Um, it's, it's an exciting, the next, the next 10 years are very, very, very exciting. I'm sorry. And, and you remember this gentleman, Norbert Wiener, on, on patterns. Okay, so where else can we look at, you know, where can we use machine learning? So I started to collect words that had pattern and the notion of pattern. So all these words have a notion of a pattern. So it seems like we're going to be able to use machine learning for things that we've been talking about, like you know, temperament, predisposition, the genre, proclivity. If you think about it, they all represent patterns. So there's, there's, a, there's a deeper impact. I mean, what we do as humans and what, and what machines do, it's kind, of, it's kind of cool, but it's also scary, right? But I think if we proceed without thinking about you know, uh, ethics, we can go into a really nasty, nasty area. So that's why ethics is really important and why I think that international law has to be really, really important. We have to have some sort of like a, a UN, maybe a more effective UN, a UN for, for data and for machine learning. Because if we don't, if we're not careful, this takes away a lot of the stuff that makes us human. And also, not just for um, just the human aspect, but from a business point of view. So the, a lot of workers um, will be needed. Right? And a lot of jobs in an enterprise can be done by machine. Let's face it, a lot of it can't. And when, what happens when you have companies that, that get rid of thousands of people? Right? Like, so over time, you don't need them. What, happen, what happens to them? Okay, okay, yeah, your company's more profitable, but, but what happens to those people, those workers? And what happens to the countries, not just the companies, but the countries? <laughs> So, like in India, in India, call centers are very big, right? Call centers, there's a lot of call centers in India. They generate a lot of money. They generate uh, a lot of money, and they're a lot of money, and they, they contribute to the Indian economy. What happens to call centers with that now? What happens to the economy of India? <coughs> what happens to the strength of India as a power in the world? So this is this is important stuff to think about. Right? So it's it's not just thinking about you know the the, the languages with Python, Java, but there are, there are economic things to think about, and it's short term things, longer term things, very very um, interesting things, and we're, and we're starting to see countries start to think about this. But of course, there's the, there's the people with the white hats and the people with the black hats on the planet, right? So we have to be careful. So, as I said in the beginning, I think this is an inflection point for, for all of us, for computing, for enterprises, for countries, and for civilization. So take advantage of it. And being developers here, we can, we, we're right to take advantage of it for, for, our, for our companies and for ourselves, too, for our careers. 
So, but take very careful advantage of it, and, and uh, it would be interesting. So, thanks. I was at a presentation uh, at Columbia. They have the Columbia Data Science Institute. And the Professor Wing mentioned maybe uh, having a coalition come up with a, a code of ethics for developers, programmers, much like doctors have, where they have a code where they, we uh, do no harm so that developers have something to say, to push back with. What, what, what That's I, I totally agree. I think there has to be some sort of code of ethics, um, and also with data, since data is so important. Like I, you know, if I'm working on a project, I'll get a data set from someplace. Right? There's one, there's thousands of data sets. How do I know the origin of the data set? So there has to be some sort of logging, auditing mechanism. Because I'm going to take it, I'm going to change it, and somebody's going to take it from me and change it, and somebody's take it from me and change it. So there's, it, this seems, if I was, if I wanted to do a startup company. Having some sort of distributed ledger that tracks auditing of the data from machine learning, I would say that would be a cool startup to, to work on. Because you have to track who's touching the data, when did they touch it, how did they touch it, because you don't want to use like raw data, right? So, there's, so I, and I totally agree there has to be some sort of uh, ethic, co ethics codes. Hi. So just going forward on the idea that something might have to be done about it so that these things are used ethically. You, you talked a little bit, maybe there needs to be an international agreement. So you have data and you have algorithms, right? Which do you think would be more controllable? More controllable? Data or algorithms? Right. Probably algorithms are easier, more easier to control. Data is difficult. As I said, like history, the, the auditing of the data, that's just really, that's hard. Because, I mean, we have not just companies in New York, but companies in, in the U.S., companies on the planet, right? It's countries. It, it's, a, it's a big, big problem in right? tracking data. And, and, of course, the CDOs, the chief data officers of the companies understand this. I mean, they're probably, I would say, like, pretty soon, the all, all CDOs on every company on the planet has to be like certified, you know, all these all about regulations and privacy and ethics. I mean CDOs, it used to be like CTOs, CIOs became the CEOs. To me it's almost like the CDOs are going to be more running companies so because they're going to understand their data and data is, is valuable more than the algorithms. Because the algorithms of the future, I mean neural networks, you know, maybe some differential equation stuff and pretty straightforward stuff. Nothing tricky. Very easily implementable. It's the data. It's impossible to predict how it's going to be used, though. Right? I mean, you say, oh, you know, drones are used for terrorist attacks now, so we should regulate drones. That's true, but, but let's say that you're a company and you need a data set, and you want to use a data set for to track for mortgages. Okay, where, where did that data come from? Who changed it? So for those, for some things, honestly, not for everything, it's impossible to do that. But for some things, where someone's life is at stake, or financial life is at stake, you want some guarantee that this data was clean data. And I'm sure we're going to find out that all the data we use is biased in some fashion. All the data on the planet right now is biased in some fashion. So maybe at 100%, maybe 20% of the data is actually usable. Yes? Um, I not sure if I missed, you said you have a slide of, of good uh, learning sites or, or resources. I did say it, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I may have taken that slide. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize if you know that. Um, I we definitely have to put that slide in, I forgot to do that. Uh, we we um, definitely can do that on the announce channel yeah. on New York Java like anyways. Yes. You can okay. have a discussion there. Thank you, Chandra. That's a good idea. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the, in the, uh, the panel list. Thank you. Yes. So in uh, Java, uh, we have we have jar files that can give you a self-contained jar file to run. In machine learning, is there a standard for models? What what are these models? Is there a way to run them, deploy them? You, you mean sort of like a uh, standardized view of a model? 
Does the work I give you a model so you can go run it the same way I can give you yeah, a so chart? Yeah, that, so that's, that's, that actually makes sense. That's a, that's a good point. There's some people talking about like if I have using TensorFlow, using versus some other system, I want to take a model here and I want to use it someplace else. Right now, there's no standard for that. People are talking about some some format for representing a model so that I can use it in different places. But right now, that doesn't exist, but people are definitely talking about it. Because you, you want to work on it here, take it out, take it out with production in TensorFlow or in Cortana or wherever, wherever right? That makes sense. But it's still early. You could invent the format data format. <laughs> Yes, back there. Yeah, most of the work is actually generally data prep, but especially in supervised learning when you are trying to come up with features and then um, which data to prove which one with noise, which one with like classes, and you want to throw it to say Amazon Turk or Mechanical Turk and find out the classes to collect. So yeah, the more complex the model, the more data you need, like four layer neural network, you need millions, right? And then smaller decision trees, you need fewer. Then, uh, presentation, you said that most of the work is data prep, but what are some ways to do it? Like, what are some strategies? Most of the textbook and uh, even the courses talk about it. Here are the algorithms. Here are the Where is the data prep side? So, I don't share your question. So, what are the, some ways to, what are some ways to actually prepare the data? What are some good That's uh, That's a whole sources? separate talk in itself. That's like, you know, talking about. Spark, you know, and talking about how to ingest data and how to normalize data. That's that's a whole that's like that's a whole hour of conversation. That's like just data engineering, basic data engineering. There's I mean, a lot of uh, statistics over there because even before you got to artificial intelligence, there was always a problem where you took in data from various sources, right? Whenever you did business intelligence, you had the problem of data. So there's a lot of techniques that are in use for a very long time where you take data and you try to complete it. So a lot of that is actually statistical. Yeah, it's nothing, it's nothing new. It's stuff that we've been doing for years and years and years yep. of clean, cleaning data. Yep. Right. Yes? You know about JSR you mentioned? Like, is it something coming out in Java? Uh, well, the, the JSR, I'm working on JSR 381. So JSR 381 is visual recognition for Java, the API for that, and it's in beta, which is released yesterday, in beta. So it's specifically for visual recognition. So a couple years ago, when we noticed that there was no Java, that we had to learn Python for Java, we said, like, we have to help Java become first class citizen, but you can't boil the ocean, right? So I so said, what can we do that's, that's a deliverable? Like, any every manager knows that, right? What's, what's a deliverable? It's like, well, we can order visual you know, API in a year, so we work on that. So that's what we just released yesterday. So it's a standard job API for visual recognition. Yes. There are a few uh, academic courses and other courses for uh, data science. Do you have any recommendations? So courses for data science, there's so um, so Andrew Eng, who's like he's the guy who started Coursera, the, the, the big uh, MOOC. What's the MOOC stand for? Uh, massive Open Online Course. Massive, massive Online what? Massive open online course. Yes, thank you. Book. So, book, yeah. <laughs> um, he has, and, and on the um, uh, deep learning.ai, or I had the, the, the URL up there. Yeah. So, um, and also just Google for Andrew Ang Intro to Machine Learning. As I said, the, his first one, which probably takes probably an hour to watch, um, and it's, he did it at Stanford too, so that's another search term to use. It's, it's a really good introduction, and he gives some working examples on all you know the various techniques and it's and it's definitely listenable without hurting your head. <laughs> the second one I had to constantly refer to my statistics book and I'm like okay, go back to logistic regression and then linear regression and find out yeah. You know. So that one took a little bit of time for me to go through but it's it's worthwhile. That's the underpinnings right the other stuff. Yes. So with the more recent versions of Java like certainly you know there's been a move towards like kind of like big data processing, right, with the streaming APIs and stuff. Like, how, how do you fit, like, I see like Java 8 streams and, and kind of fitting into this um, machine learning and deep learning. And yeah, there's that, actually that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good question. So I've had discussions with, with Brian Getz, who's the architect of Java, 
And you know, at, at QCon a couple months ago, I sat down and we were talking about how Java is evolving. And, and I said, like, you know, Java needs this, Java needs that. He said, you know, Java is not oblivious to the environment what's happening. So it knows that data processing machine, so it's progressing along the same lines as machine learning libraries are. So there's even things like value types, you know, or, or something that we really require for performance in machine learning. Um, uh, and another thing, she said that John is fully aware of what machine learning um, requires. So you're right, the things like streams and things like that, there, there are all these uh, things in Java already, but the things that are coming in future Java that Brian says like definitely will help machine learning. Yes. Could you point me in the right in some direction to learn more about uh, data poisoning, prevention, detection? Data poisoning. I can probably email you. I have stuff at home. I, I can email. So you have my web, my email address, right? Just just remind me. I'll send it to you. Yes. Uh, one of the slides you had up was like this mind map decision tree of algo. Is that something you came up with, or is that some no, that's something? That's something I found because I know that. The first time I gave this talk, people said like they, they assumed that there was one type of neural network, and and uh, there's not, and one type of algorithm, and there's not. There's multiple machine learning algorithms, multiple neural network uh, implementations <coughs> types. And, uh, That's the reason why. Is there some good resource in the pattern there itself? What is how do you pick the right path? To this? Yeah, so this I mean, is part of, being a data yeah, this is part of like when you're a data scientist and you know like, this is why you have to have a data scientist on team. When I was at Lehman Brothers, we got economists that I used to talk to all the time, and they were the ones that the experts on, on crunching the numbers for why they did certain things. They were terrible programmers. <laughs> <laughs> they were really bad programmers, that's why they hired me. You know, and luckily I was I was able to, to code your stuff in CS plus plus. But um, uh, just remind remind I'll, I'll I'll send you where I have you have my email address, please. Or, or post it to the uh, to, to the mailing list. Any other questions? Yes. More of a fun question, really. Um, do you think we're heading more towards uh, Terminator kind of endgame or more like uh, <laughs> I really want S -mod. Yeah. So so there's it's interesting. Like people, half the people I I know that I know respect say that we are moving in that direction, where it's a very dangerous future, and then half of the people I know say like. No, this is just sort of like another invention, like the cotton gin. It's like, you know, it, yeah, it hurt a lot of people, hurt a lot of industries, but it, 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 we uh, we moved ahead, you know, and it was a positive thing. So it's it's an interesting discussion. I mean, I just think we have to be really, really careful, you know. And it's not just that we force ethically and privacy and all that stuff. We have we have to do that. Um, but I can see some dangers. I can see some a lot of dangers, like if we're not careful and then we don't. Regulate this stuff in a certain way. You know, some people will say like, "Well, so there, there are pundits in the Bay Area that say like, you know, in the future, you know, large jobs will disappear, but they just you know, learn some, become a, a new type of doctor, or become a neurologist, or become a, a this and a that." And you know, I, being a musician, I know what the average person that I talk to in the musician world, as opposed to my computer sphere, <laughs> it's a different type of person. <laughs> Um, you know, and I don't think my musician friends are going to learn about neurology and, and new types of computing and things like that. So there's the average person on the planet, right? And there's us the developers, right? We're hopefully over to the right hand side of the Gaussian curve, right? Like this. But these people in the middle. What happens to the people in the middle? That's what I'm worried about, right? And for, for countries too. You know, if you're running a country, you're a minister of you know education. What do you do? Or minister of technology. It's really important, right? The way you fight this is with education, but the problem is the human race has been really bad at education over, over centuries, right? Really, really bad. And it's getting worse. Like universities aren't teaching the right thing. I, I, this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Universities aren't teaching the right things. People are graduating from school not knowing how to become a productive developer. And these are major universities. There's only two or three in the U.S. that are doing the right thing, and, and, and elsewhere. So it's education is a solution. Which one? Are they? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you later. Bias. <laughs> you know, there's, there's some schools doing it, but I mean, I talk to universities around the world, and it's amazing the stuff. Some major the universities are teaching assembler. It's like assembler. They're coming out of school and not even knowing the basics of 
uh, you know, agile development or, I mean, I know that's, that's training and not education, but still you have to be aware of this stuff and just not being taught the right things. And it's, it's a worldwide problem. Any other questions? Yes. Remember there were languages, least small talk, what happened to them? They were approximately the same. Yeah, this uh, prologue. So I did it back in the 80s, I dealt with Prolog, we were doing it, I worked at the New York Stock Exchange, we were in a surveillance school, and we were looking at pattern trading patterns, and seeing who was potentially illegal stuff or not, and inside trading, so we were using Prolog. What happened to Prolog? What happened to Prolog is you couldn't debug it. So you create this nice little thing, and it's like, all right, I think there's a bug in it, so now what do we do? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> couldn't debug it. So it was cool, but so and list, of course, every language has elements of list nowadays, right? List isn't every the, the means of list for every language we use. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, thanks everybody. The next one is.